Welcome to the Real Chili Podcast. And the Golden Eagles of Marquette University in Milwaukee are bound for the Final Four for only the third time ever. Five seconds left. Marquette down by one. Trying to avoid the upset. Blew the drive. The left hand. It's good. Every day, as basketball players, as students, and I want to win every day, most importantly, as people. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Real Chili Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lavender. I'm joined by Pete Mohan, Pete Worth, and Brian Henry. we got a full crew today to talk about the biggest win of Marquette's season so far, a 102-94 victory over the Creighton Blue Jays on the road at Omaha. Plenty to dive into into this game. Marquette gave up the most points it has given up to an opposing team this season. But, fellas, the offensive performance that our team put on was astounding. We shot 60% from the field, 50% from the three-point line for the game. And the most promising thing to me is our seniors, Luke Fisher, Juwan Johnson, Caton Reinhardt stepped up in a big way. I hope all of you have gotten up and gotten yourselves to church on this fine Sunday morning because praise be, praise be to everything. (laughs) That was absolutely spectacular from an offensive standpoint from start to finish. Uh, And Mike, you alluded to the fact that it was the three seniors that did. Uh, There is high praise for Caton. There's high praise for Juwan. And there are heaps of high praise for Luke Fisher that we will dive into. That was as complete an offensive performance that I've seen in 10 years of watching Marquette basketball. Clearly the votive candle that uh, my grandma lit for Kate and Reinhardt over the weekend were. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, you know, she might have lit it earlier than you thought. I was crunching some numbers this morning just to get a perspective on the transformation Kate has made throughout this season. In non-conference play, he shot 31% from the field and about 31% from three. In conference play, he's shooting 50% from the field and 42% from three. So Kate although got off to a rocky start, has been pretty good in conference consistently. Uh, We saw that again last night. On this pod, we have talked a lot about Luke Fisher. We have said consistently that if he brings the effort, he can be a player that changes the game and tips the scale in our favor. Well, yeah, especially on the defensive end where you see the the number six blocks and yeah. just kind of wonder why he can't be that kind of defensive force uh, every game. Well, uh, hang on, hang on. S- six blocks is a slightly unrealistic hope to hold a center, any center to. But Right, I'm not saying that exact statistic every game, but be that sort of presence down there yep. where he's aggressive on the defensive boards. And aggressive trying to disrupt penetrators' shots at the rim. And and then being consistent on offense. I mean, he had a, a nice array of different post moves down there with a, nice, a kind of a 10-foot lefty hook, mm-hmm. which uh, I didn't think he could do that far away from the basket. Some really, really nice moves that, that he put on display last night and made the, our offense that much better, that much better for our guards to be able to get open looks with his presence down there. And you know what was what was equally as impressive is that Luke was doing it against a future NBA talent. Yes, a young NBA talent, but that wasn't some slouch down there. That was a, a – Patton is a big kid, uh, going to be a great player, made some really impressive moves uh, handling the ball the other day, which, oh, boy, that's going to be fun to go up against for another few years. Mm-hmm. But Luke Fisher, you know, just took it to him yeah. and, and kind of played with that aggressive, unique style that we know he can if he brings it. Three assists, too. Right. Yeah, and, and Patton was in foul trouble a lot, you know, and that and that definitely helped his cause. But Butler doesn't have, besides uh, Weidman and Travis, they, they don't have a very – imposing front court Luke was non-existent in that game it was really good to see him kind of turn it around now he need to, he needs to get out of this funk where he's off this routine where he's off a game on a game now they are a different basketball team when he is effective in the post it draws double teams it forces help side defense uh, to try to come down and dig the ball and as we have demonstrated our shooting prowess is not a streaky thing it, it seems to be there just about every night I'm sure we'll have a game at some point where it's not there. But just about every game, uh, Marquette's hitting over 45% of their threes, it feels like, uh, whether in conference play. If Luke is effective on the block, posting up, and we can get him the ball, it opens 
everything up out there for more of those guys. I I can't say enough good things. Mike, that stretch in the first half where he had three blocks on a possession and then ran the floor, missed a rebounded a missed layup and hit a half hook. Was that early second half? No, no, that was the right time, but JJJ got blocked and Luke hustled sprinted down the court, yeah. grabbed the board and laid it up and in. It was the best sequence of his career. And I'm not that's not hyperbole. It it, it really was. Jeez. It was. <laughs> You're not going to find a better stretch. Of three bubbles went through and check all the tape. Hey, give me a better game that he's played. Maybe the Arizona State game, his first one. That that, that is hands down his best performance. I agree in a Marquette mm-hmm. uniform. I'm not trying to belittle other good games he's had against that opponent in that setting. That's the best. That's the best he's played since he's been at Marquette. Okay, Brian. The last eleven games of the Big East season. He was only two points and two rebounds away. <laughs> Will he average a 20 and 10 for the last 11 Big East games? The question is, dare he? I think the question you meant to ask me is, will he get a single 20 and 10 at some point? Uh, it, it was fun to watch. I mean, when he's... And I'll tell you what. I mean, look, as much as we will, are sitting here and going, yeah, they pulled away, they still gave up 94 points as Michael... They needed everything they got out of him in order to win that game. Otherwise, we're in a dogfight down the stretch, mm-hmm. and we're God forbid we came on this pod by if we scored ninety and lost, and we're, you know where all of our heads would be again. But they needed it from everybody. Luke was a huge part of it, uh, and it was great to see. When I mentioned earlier in the year about how looking at uh, the conference schedule and our shooting percentages, there's a high floor for our conference schedule record, just because of our shooting percentages. This is one of those cases where when you shoot sixty percent from the field 50 from three and 75 percent from the line this is a shooting win you know yeah, absolutely who, know, who knows what happens if those crazy shots that reinhardt takes rims out you know and he doesn't go on that stretch of four made shots i don't know if we win this game 100 percent. when you just look on a macro level of the importance that shooting has for this squad these are the type of games that no one expects that you just end up winning because you have shooters like that on your team. And it's something to look forward to, but again, it's something that we can't rely on. And part of the reason that you guys mentioned is that it took that secondary effort on defense, you know, from Luke and some of the other guys to really preserve what was an amazing offensive performance. In watching the film, you know, what really jumped out to me the second time seeing it was how good, not only how good our ball movement has gotten, these guys are clearly gelled on the offensive end, but they've gotten so good at getting into the lane. And if they don't have a shot, they're kicking it out. Mm-hmm. These coaches have clearly been drilling it into them, and they know, they know, they know their teammates can shoot. Get in the lane. If you don't have a shot, don't throw it up. Kick it out. Someone's there's someone open. Someone's yeah. Someone's going to be open, and if they're not, they'll make a move and get open. Yeah, and especially if you see our improvement from the Michigan game. Yeah, yeah. In the second half, when Creighton switched to that one-three-one, our ball movement was very crisp, very efficient, and we found the open look numerous times, which was a huge improvement um, over a similar uh, Michigan defense early in the season. Just great to see us moving the ball to beat that zone instead of trying to beat it off the dribble. Are we in consensus that this this was a steal of a victory? This was a lucky lucky timing to get them right now without Watson. Right. We we kind of we kind of buried the lead a little bit without talking about, you know, the absence of Watson. Yeah, you know, I think we did not beat the Creighton team that earned a number 7 ranking. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But we beat a very good team on the road. And so, yes, there there's some space in between those. Not enough to take away from these kids. The Marquette basketball Instagram account posted a video of uh, the tunnel in the locker room after the game. And, you know, what you saw from these kids, they are clearly so excited to be doing as well as they are. You can see it on the bench. Every single one of those guys, they've bought in. They believe this coach. They believe this coaching staff. You can see it uh, just in their attitude. And I thought probably the most impressive thing, aside from Luke Fisher yesterday, was they came to play. They didn't play for the full 40, at least on the defensive end, but they were in that game mentally from the tip. That's something to build on. That's something that, you know, that's from the coaches. I think the biggest thing that everyone was watching in that second half was when Creighton makes their one run, are they going to pucker again? And when they cut it down to, I think it was 10 or 11 points and started to put a couple baskets together and the – the arena that that sold out building got into it again and you could kind of sense it you, yeah they immediately responded yeah i don't think we i don't yeah they, i don't think they let him get closer than nine uh in that second half so i mean that's that in itself even though you know creighton 
kind of to- kind of torched our defense in the second half for 54 points. I think we responded with 52 ourselves and kept 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 pace with uh, right with them. So that I think that was the best sign to see out of all of it. Caitlin was surprisingly um, competent handling the ball on the press, which was good to see both him and, and Howard be able to get the ball across half court every time without turning the ball over. That was I, I was impressed by that from from Caitlin. They couldn't guard him. Yeah, Mister Blow by Caitlin Reinhardt. Well, Wojo put him in that position. Right. Are, are you a surprise? I mean, the announcers made a did a very good job pointing out during the game of how much of a matchup problem Reinhardt was going to be. And I, I was listening to it going, okay, I, I kind of see it. What did they say? I was at a bar. I didn't have they, they basically were driving the point that, that Creighton's bigs were not quick enough to stay with him off the dribble. And if you notice, there were quite a few possessions where they'd put him in pick and roll so that they would switch a bi- a bigger big onto him and he'd go off the dribble or they'd rescreen for him. And he got a lot of his looks that way. It was It was – it was a pretty brilliant move. Now looking at it, you know, a day later, it was a pretty brilliant stretch by Wojo, and Creighton struggled to guard it. They went to it two or three times in the second half. They would run the weave until they matched up Hegner on Reinhardt, and he'd just take him to the rack. That's another effect from the from the Watson injury, you know, that, that, that worked mm-hmm. in our favor. Well, I think we'd be remiss to not mention Juwan's game. I mean, although he had four turnovers, he had a pretty dynamic offensive performance as well. Shooting six of thirteen for eighteen points. He had four three pointers. And and he just looks like he's in rhythm right now, you know? I mean yeah, he's he does. he's playing with confidence and he doesn't have to be the man necessarily. We've got a bunch of guys that can pick up the slack in different games. And I think that if he had to be the guy, he wouldn't perform as well. He's not like the shoulder the load type of guy, but his movement is what makes our offense work. You could guard three point shooters and you can guard Luke. But once you have guys attacking that interior and getting to the rack on their cuts, it completely throws the defense out of rhythm, and that's what provides those open looks on the three-point line. So I think the key for us is you know, to continue to get that performance from Juwan, and what we really need is Hanif to pick it up. Um, he's just He hasn't been in rhythm, and, and it's not for a lack of ability at all. We, we've talked about it before, but he just looks a little out of sorts, and I think if if Hanif can really put it together here for the final stretch that we're, we're really looking at a dynamic team. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think Hanif, even though despite putting up 11 points, still wasn't his, him, his old self. Uh, but defensively, he's still a dog on the defensive end. I, I oh, you know, yeah. kind of isoed on him a little bit. To your point about Juwan, you know, one of the most interesting things, just looking at his stat line and 18 points, one steal. When, when Juwan has these big games – Typically, you see him with three, four, five, even five steals. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the case yesterday. He was filling it up from the three-point line, which is somewhat of an anomaly for him. You know, just kind of across the board, we could talk about all these guys. Rousey was perfect from the field. Three for three from the field, two for two from three, three for three from the free throw line. So this Marquette team was clicking on all cylinders on the offensive side of the ball. Switching over to the defensive side of the ball, we held Creighton to 40 points in the first half. In the second half, we gave up 54 points and overall allowed 94 points for a season high. Clearly, our offensive firepower was the story in this game. But what can't be lost is the fact that our defense hasn't changed because we won this game. Our defense is still susceptible to a Creighton team that just lost one of its best players and best distributors. So I, I think that's a concerning aspect. Uh, in contrast to that, though, however, according to Ken Palm, this was our fastest-paced game in terms of number of possessions. Yeah. So that will be one reason that you see the higher score. Now, obviously, you got to make the shots and you have to play the defense. But you know, if this was played at an average pace, maybe the score is more like. 90 to 83 or something like that. So it's not a an extremely high-scoring game for the number of possessions, the number of fouls and stuff that there were. But but still... I started a tally at some point during watching this game of how many... Uh, Creighton pushes the ball really well in the fast break. They, they move it really well. and, and our, We do, too. We do, too. But, our, I, you know, I'm just focusing in on defense. We... We struggled to get back a number of times, and Creighton got to the rack. I had a tally going, and it's mm-hmm. it's above five that they that they did that just in the second half. I've asked this question of you guys before, and I think it's even more telling after this one. Is isn't this what we are? Yeah. yeah. Look, if they're if they're going to have success and find a way to get to ten or eleven conference wins, it's going to be scoring 
north of 87 plus points a game because if they're going to steal one against a Villanova Xavier Butler again that's what it's going to take we don't have the defense to, to lock someone down under 70 and grind out a win we just don't I agree we don't have the ability to do that but let me throw this back at you if Luke Fisher not saying he gets six blocks every game but if he can give that type of energy I mean his arms were you know, he was like one of those air things in front of, uh, you know, car dealerships. He, he he was... Oh, a wacky, waving, arm-flailing, inflatable tube man? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's what he was. Yeah. He, wow, you had that one queued geez. up ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, we planned that ahead of time. So, if Luke can be that presence down low, which he hasn't been consistently this season, certainly to the extent we saw last night, that changes us defensively. No, we're not going to be a stellar defensive team. Right, Brian? I mean, do you... Do, that's going to change the equation for, for the quality of team we are. It changes it a little bit, but again, Luke Luke has not demonstrated an ability to string games like, like, like that together. And I, I think it'd be fairly foolish to assume, well, if Luke can do that, we'll just be... He delivered a great performance in a big game. I, right. I, I don't expect on Tuesday against Villanova we're going to see a similar type of defensive effort. Prove me wrong, I hope. Well, it's another not very big team. And that'll present a very unique thing. That's what we said the first time, though. Well, the opportunity is there for him to dominate physically, and so it's really it's up to him. Yeah, and Villanova moves the ball so well around the perimeter. Um, sometimes it sometimes it kind of renders uh, big men obsolete, but we'll see. To answer your question, Mike, I, I, I take the wait-and-see approach. If you made me pick one or the other, I'd say no. But may, maybe this is a launching point for him, but... We, we, we've got to see. It would it would definitely change everything. I'd, I'd say that. I think Wojo's biggest problem he needs to solve right now is how... Hang on. Is back sweat? Because, yes, you're 100% right. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's just Marquette coaches in general. Oh, my God, was that frightening in the, at the end of that game. Yeah, not just his back. That was full-on chest, pits, arms. He, he was sweating all over the place there. <laughs> that was unbelievable. Channeling buzz out there. Yeah. Sorry, continue. His second biggest problem right now is where to hide Sam Hauser on defense. Because Sam Hauser's getting into foul trouble every game. And he's in the post trying to guard these big, um, experienced, big East athletes. And he doesn't have the physical skills to do it. I mean, he'll try to stick his hands up. He does a, g- a good job of just sticking his hands up and being as tall as he can. But he doesn't have the athleticism to either challenge a shot or stay with the guy. And then he gets in foul trouble. And he gets these fouls because the refs are calling ticky-tack stuff where either he leans into a guy with his chest or vice versa. So he can't just stay there with his ha- hands up, just hoping that they're not going to call a foul. That's a terrific point about Sam Hauser. I, you can't see us, but we were all nodding our heads along with Pete Worth when he made that statement. One final point on the defense. I, I think another thing that jumped out on the tape was it looks like the team is starting to take accountability for their teammates in defensive lapses. I noticed Kaiten Reinhardt in particular yelling at teammates when they missed the defensive assignment. When you have players... Oh, yeah, because he because he's a good one to hold everybody accountable. When you have other players holding players accountable, that means something. You can't write that off. Final thing, I, we got a question from uh, one of our Twitter followers the other day. Ooh. And here's the simple question that I want us to go out on. Is Marquette good? <laughs> uh, we're good at offense. But are we the difference? We're, we're good at offense, and we're, we're capable. Ken Pomeroy has us ranked as the 32 te- number 32 team in the country. Anytime you're in like the top 10% of teams in the nation, I would venture to say that we are good. That, now that that's off the table. Are we good enough? We're not good enough to party yet. <laughs> I think we're good enough at least to get people excited about this team. We got that fin- finally got that big, big road win. And so now the guys can kind of relax, build this resume, maybe play a little defense. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, don't ask too much. Don't if they, much. yeah, if they feel like it. Maybe a little defense here and there. They have a chance to finish over the um, over five hundred for the season in the Big East. So I'll answer it. Yes, we are good. No, I don't think we're good enough yet because of the as strong as the offensive end is, the defense is equally as mind blowingly frustrating. And if the goal is making the NCAA tournament, are we good enough for that? I'll I'll kind of parlay the question to that. I don't think we are yet, but I think we are moving in the right direction right now, and I certainly could see us getting there. By good enough, your first use of the phrase, what what do you mean by that, Brian? Good enough to make the NCAA tournament. Is this, a, is this an NCAA tournament caliber role? That's the ultimate question, right? That's what we're here for. I think that's the high, that's the ceiling of this team. It's an NCAA tournament offense 
for sure. I mean, top 10 in efficiency mm-hmm. now after that win yesterday. Can we parlay parlay that into a NCAA berth? Absolutely, we can. It's not going to be a high seed, but we're definitely the fifth best team in the Big East. Ex- excuse me? I think that's without... Definitely? I think, I think so. Did you see both of our games against Seton Hall? Didn't feel like we were definitely the fifth best team in the Big East. Well, Seton Hall is a yeah, they're a bad matchup for for us, but we're a better team than them. We showed that by the leads that we got out to, but both games. In my mind, that that's kind of a given. And now we beat Creighton once, um, and they have to come back to our place, and we have still haven't faced Xavier yet. I'm not saying we're you know beating the world, but our offense is extremely impressive. Our defense needs to catch up. Just for juxtaposition's sake, I happened to be at the Florida State Louisville game yesterday. And, uh, you know, both teams are essentially top 10 ACC teams. Florida State is a team that I don't think we would be able to compete with. They're just big and they rebound and play defense. But looking at Louisville, I thought we're a better team than them. They're, they're just like a discombobulated, poor, typical Patino, poor offense, you know, fadeaway jumpers and offensive rebounds off air balls are their only offense. So looking at them, it's like, all right, well, if they're the number 12 team in the country, and we look consistently better than a team like this, then I think that we are good. I, I would look forward to a matchup, second round matchup with Louisville very wholeheartedly. No matter where you think Marquette should fall in the Big East standings right now, they are currently fourth in the Big East standings behind Villanova, Butler, and Creighton at the time of recording on Sunday morning. That could change with the outcome of today's Xavier game. Later this week on Tuesday, Marquette welcomes Villanova to Milwaukee. This is going to be a big game. Hopefully the crowds can get there. Do you guys want to do predictions on Villanova? Loss. (laughs) (laughs) So we're not going to do predictions on... (laughs) Do you need need any more analysis after that? (laughs) No. Oh, that's so good. All right. Uh, Fellas, let's do quick predictions on Villanova. Just in a couple words, even one word, if you can keep it to that. I'll keep it to one letter for you, and it's a big capital L. Pete Mohan. I'm going to say we play them a little tighter than last time. Maybe a more complete performance, but I really don't see us winning. You know, the guys will be pretty happy with Creighton. Pete Worth. Come on, do it, Peter Worth. You know you want to. You know, DePaul hung with him on the road for a little while. (laughs) Uh, Yep. He's talking himself into it. Here we go. Coming off a big top 10 victory on the road. Luke Fisher dominating down in the post, shooting 50% from three, and I think it's going to carry over into a... 10 point Marquette loss to Villanova because they're too good. I never heard of Luke Fisher shooting 50% from three before. I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for a loss, too. I do think we play him tighter. I actually think it's a single digit difference at the end of the game. I think it's an eight or nine point loss for Marquette. I think we play him tough. I think our confidence is there to at least hang with these guys for a little while until they blow the doors off us. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today. Hope you enjoyed the Creighton recap and the Villanova preview. This is shaping up to be a fun final stretch of the season here with Marquette vying for NCAA tournament contention. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Real Chili Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lavender, signing off for Pete Mohan, Pete Worth, and Brian Henry. We'll talk to you next time.